Uh, and I'm now going to move on to our third speaker for this afternoon. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Stephen Turner to uh, the, the stage. So Steve is a hydrologist. He works at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, CEH, and is a data acquisition coordinator uh, looking at, um, uh, sorry, just need to move my slide across, the UK National River Flow Archive, NRFA. And he also provides analytical commentary for the National Hydrological Monitoring Programme. Uh, and we're going to look at hydrology. So the focus now is, I guess, the, the water on the ground once it's fallen from the sky as rain. So I'll hand over to Stephen to take us through a look back at last year uh, and the hydrological calendar, I guess, for 2022. Great. Thank you, Liz. And hello, everybody. Um, so hopefully you can all see my slides. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about the hydrology of 2022. Um, we will talk about rainfall and temperatures like we've heard about already, but then we're going to follow that through and how that and see how that affects our rivers, our reservoirs and our groundwater levels. Um, so on the front slide here, we've got a picture of uh, Lady Bower Reservoir and um, this was taken in November 2022 and you can see quite how far that was reduced. So maybe that's a bit of a taster of uh, what we're going to see over the next few slides. So um, first of all, I just introduced the National Hydrological Monitoring Programme. Um, we've been running since 1988, um, and we aim to provide a, a voice on hydrological reporting for the whole of the UK. And it's jointly undertaken by the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and also the British Geological Survey. Um, we do a variety of um, sort of outreach. So we write uh, reports and papers about um, major events. For example, uh, this paper here is about the 2018-19 drought. Um, we do a monthly hydrological summary. And we also have um, uh, like uh, web tools that people can uh, look at interactive tools of near real-time data um, to track the hydrological situation uh, maybe in an, an area that's interesting uh, to them. And we also talk to the media and hope that we uh, can explain the situation in, in a way which lots of people, the public, the industries um, and policy people can um, understand. So uh, on our hydrological summary for the UK, um, as I said, we've been doing them every month since 1988. So there's 409 and counting <laughs> and so the last one is from uh the, the last one is from january 2023 um and we have done one every month uh, apart from in 2001 where there was the foot and mouth epidemic where a lot of the data on um the uh at the river flow gauging stations couldn't be collected uh, due to restrictions um so nearly a full record <laughs> since 1988 um, but each month, uh, we uh, have a look at all the river flow, rainfall, reservoir, and groundwater data, analyze it, and then we write a, a commentary about what's happened in that month. Um, and you can see that over the years, the front page hasn't changed very much. Um, but actually, the insides haven't changed a huge amount either in the past 34 years. Um, some of the graphs and the maps we use are very similar. We might not make hand-drawn maps anymore, <laughs> but we do work with a variety of partners to bring in data from lots of different data sources. Um, so we uh, use the rainfall data and soil moisture data from the Met Office. Um, also at UKCEH, we uh, produce a hydrological outlook. So that looks uh, forward rather than back, like the summary. Um, we receive river flow data from the UK's four main uh, measuring authorities. So uh, people like the Environment Agency in England, they run a network of gauges on the side of rivers, um, which measure river levels, and then we can convert that into flow. Um, so we can get an idea of the volumes of water we've got coming down our rivers. And from the British Geological Survey, we receive groundwater data. So that's uh, the level of groundwater um, 
in our aquifers so and stored in rocks uh, in the ground. And then uh, we also at UKCH have a network of soil moisture sensors called Cosmos UK. And so there's about 50 sites across the UK um, where we get an idea of soil moisture at a, a field scale. And lastly, reservoirs. Um, so we receive the uh, capacity of reservoirs from the individual water companies that manage the reservoirs um, and the environment agencies. Agency. So in 2022, um, as we've already heard um, from Ian and Chloe, I can imagine a lot of you might remember it uh, looking like some of these images here. Um, the sort of summer period was one of the driest and one of the hottest um, areas. If we look at this plot in the middle, we're plotting uh, mean temperature between June and August against total rainfall. And you can see 2022 is um, all the way up here, uh, joint with uh, 2018 in terms of temperature um, over that three month period. And you can see my arrow is pointing to 1976, um, which will be uh, is sort of the benchmark throughout that a lot of people and uh, remember and is also brought up quite a lot in the media. And all these little, um, all these dots uh, represent a uh, a data set that goes back to 1836. But there were significant impacts. Um, we saw um, a lot of brown grass. Um, we saw issues uh, in the farming sector with uh, reduced yields and crops and risks uh, of fire. Um, and we saw wildfires. And as I mentioned at the start, our reservoir levels um, really did uh, take a hit during that time. Um, and as we heard, uh, it wasn't just us. It was uh, seen on a European scale. I think we've already seen this map on the um, right-hand side before from Ian, um, but it shows the, the spread of the drought alerts across the continent. And we've got some pictures here of some of the impacts. Um, so we had uh, villages which were once flooded for reservoir building appearing again. We've seen old bridges uh, or remains of old bridges appear. And this was in the Tiber in Rome. And also um, we saw uh, this hunger stone in the Czech Republic. Um, the inscription is written in German on the, on the stone and says, if you see me, then weep. Um, and that relates to the fact that if the water level gets down this low, then we're going to have some serious problems with our uh, food production this year. And there are some dates inscribed on the stone. And the most recent, um, and sorry, the, the, the earliest one, we, we could sort of see ones from 1417, 1473, but they had sort of been a bit eroded over time. There's dates from 1616, and there's about 10. Um, 10 later dry years between 1707 and the most recent date on that stone is 1893. Um, so it really does show that over the, um, these sort of artifacts and rivers can, can really help us get an idea of, um, the con of putting this year into context. Um, so although the summer was perhaps the most memorable part of the year uh, in terms of hydrology, um, I guess the drought conditions that we saw in 2022 uh, do stem back all the way to uh, the winter of 2021, 2022. Um, so although February was very, um, very wet with those three named storms that Ian mentioned earlier on, um, quite a large area of the country, sort of Wales, Central and Northern England and Scotland, we saw averages of over 170% of rainfall. Um, although, although February was a very wet month, um, the, win the winter as a whole was drier than average, um, particularly across southern, um, southern England. Um, so on the right-hand side, we've got a map showing the rainfall for the winter, December 2021 to February 2022. And these brown colours, particularly in southern England, but also in Scotland, are showing that uh, we received below uh, below average rainfall, which translates 
into our middle map, which shows river flows. So we can see that the uh, sort of beige dots are all um, sort of normal river flows. Blue would be above normal, and the red ones that we can see down here in the south of England are below normal. And the numbers in the spots show the average that the, the average of the month of the period. So some of these examples, for example, the Avon here. Um, we were looking at 63% of the December to February um, uh, average over that winter. And then finally, on the uh, right hand side, we got the groundwater map. So these uh, are boreholes where we can dip the groundwater levels. And again, a very similar picture, particularly in the south of England, lots of red spots here showing that the groundwater levels. Uh, were definitely below normal um, over the winter period. So let's move on then to the spring. Um, so the spring was warm and dry. Um, again, coming off the back of a dry winter, a, a dry spring has, has led then to further decreases in river flows. You can see on this middle map now, the red dots have spread quite a lot further up the country. Not, it's not just confined to the south of England anymore. And um, we've got most of, well, almost all of England and Wales and some parts of Scotland also with below normal river flows. And you'll notice that some of these spots have got darker, um, showing that they are exceptionally low levels. And some of these dots have circles around them, like bullseyes. Um, and that's showing that over this period, um, so this map is from May 2022, um, that the ones with circles around them, so for example, the Isir in Wales or the Saw, um, we, that was the lowest May that we've seen on record. Um, so things are starting to get um, a bit more interesting <laughs> as we move on through the year. Um, this plot overlain here is the um, reservoir stocks for England, Wales, um, there's a few lines on here, so I'll quickly explain them. The black line is the is the 2022 line. So here we're here in May 2022. The dotted line is the average for the period of record, um, and this red line is a previously a previous dry year. So uh, we picked 1995 here. So you can see already the black line has dipped below the average, and it's dipped below a previous dry year. So around the end of spring um our reservoir levels are on the on the reduction which we do we would expect um but maybe at this time of year we would like them to be closer uh, to the average um so moving on again then into the summer um so on the uh, left hand side we've got the rainfall map again from the met office and we spoke about extending color scales downwards or upwards in previously. And you can see on our rainfall map here, the scale was reduced. Uh, usually it just goes down to the darker brown color, but we've taken it down to the, the reds, showing that quite a large area of the south and the south and the east of England received only 10% of its average rainfall in July 2022. Um, and as we know, in July, uh, we saw our UK record temperature of uh, 40.3 at Coningsby in Lincolnshire. That was on the 19th of July. And the summer generally was settled with little rain during most of July and August. Um, the summer itself actually registered as the fifth driest for England and Wales in a series from 1836. Um, so it was this combination of dry and hot weather, which meant that the summer in England, um, sort of the, the summer 2022 joined a bit of an exclusive club of exceptionally hot and dry summers. So I'm talking about 1976, 1995 and 2018. Um, this plot in the middle, the purple plot, uh, is showing the reservoir stocks for England and Wales. Um, and this is the reservoir stocks for the end of July every year, going back to, to 1990. And you can see that uh, our bar for 2022 is the uh, lowest on record uh, from, from when it started in 1990. 
many reservoir store, store stocks below 20% below average for that time of year. Um, and it was above that in other um, other reservoirs, such as uh, in the southwest of England, we saw uh, stocks below sort of 35% below average. So with this lack of rainfall and high temperatures that we've seen up to this point in 2022, um, drought status started being declared um, in late August and early September across uh, England and Wales. Um, you might have seen in the summer, some of the leaves started falling off the trees uh, quite a lot earlier than we'd expect, than we normally see that in autumn, due to the stress that they uh, were receiving because of the lack of water and the heat. And as we've already mentioned, there was uh, wildfires. Um, and the, here, here's our, ma our rainfall map for the summer. And um, so again, from June to August, it's brown all over really. <laughs> Not much to say about that. It was very dry. Um, and looking again at our reserve as our, our river flow levels for August 2022, again, a similar picture, lots of red dots and a lot of more of these darker red dots. Some rivers, for example, the Anacloy in Northern Ireland, it was the lowest August river flows on record. And it saw just a 4% of its average August flows. So really, really quite uh, extreme in cases. So how did the summer compare to other events? And um, what I've got here are some maps showing the standardized precipitation index, which I'll refer to SPI. It's just a way of standardizing the rainfall across different periods. Um, and here we're looking at a three month uh, accumulation. So the three months uh, up to and including July. So the left hand, um, map is showing 2022. Uh, the darker red colours showing um, severely dry conditions. Um, we might have a few areas, for example, in East Anglia of uh, extremely dry conditions. And we can have a look at some previously dry periods. So I pick some out here. Let's have a look at 1976. Um, you can see that the May to July period was actually pretty similar in 2022 compared to 1976. Um, and then having a look at 2018 on the this far right one, um, perhaps 2018 was a bit more extreme during this um, the May to July. Um, but it just gives you an idea of um, how we've how how severe this period was in 2022 compared to some other notable years. Um, so how did it compare to other events? We've, um, we've talked about some of these other events already. Um, and on the right hand side, we've got two, uh, two plots. And these show the river flows at two different gauging stations. We've got the Tor down in Devon and the Derwent uh, further up north. And we've got some data from um, three notable years. So the red is showing the river flows from 1976. The green is from 1995 and the blue 2018. And our 2022 data is the black line. So here we are in uh, July. And we can see that for most of June and July, the 2022 data was actually uh, below. It was the lowest on, on record um, and, and below notable years like 1976. Um, and whilst on the tour down in Devon, the, the black and the red line are sort of tussling and jostling. So at points, the tour was, the, was lower than in, it was 1976, but as the year uh, as the year progresses now we'll move on the maps um as you can see now we're at the end and now we're in august um there was a bit more rainfall which caused river flows to increase um so perhaps they weren't the lowest on record again and then unfortunately my colors changed sorry about that <laughs> um but um the red is 1976 
black is 2022 uh, and yellow 2018. So now we're in September, um, where again still some of the some of the lowest flows we've seen on these rivers. Um, and then lastly, we're going into the autumn. We've might have had a few periods where flows got higher, but on both the Derwin and the Tor in Devon, our 2022 flows are the lowest uh, on record. In some of these pre previous drought years, as sort of as soon as we got into the autumn, we saw a lot more rainfall, which boosted the river flows um, uh, back up again. But we didn't see that so much in the autumn this year. Uh, oh, there is one more. <laughs> so we didn't see that in the autumn until a lot later on, I, I, I would say. So in November and December, um, we had a a bit more rainfall, which caused these flows to increase. So it was a bit of a, a late, a, possibly a more prolonged drought period. And we didn't see that recovery until a little bit later. So just thinking about where we are now, um, I guess we've had the winter, so the drought's all over, isn't it? Um, the September to January rainfall we've seen was above average, is about 110% for the whole of the UK. And Wales and most areas in England are now in recovery from drought. So that's on this map on the right hand side, this sort of hatched yellow and green colour, that means these areas are in recovery from drought. Um, but South West and East Anglia are still in drought. Our end of January reservoir stocks are around 89% of average, um, and some of those are less uh, in the South West and East Anglia. And our groundwater levels in East Anglia remain very low. Um, the current seasonal outlook suggests that the spring is likely to be dry, um, or perhaps average or drier than average. And we can see so far in February this year, um, with only a few days to go, we've not had that much rainfall at all. So in terms of our prospects for 2023, um, we are really relying on um, some quite wet conditions to sort of give us a bit of resilience over the summer of 2023. Um, bearing in mind we're coming, on the, coming into 2023 on the back of low river flows, low reservoirs already. So we've got quite a bit of making up to do. So I guess that'll be interesting. The Environment Agency says that although the situation's improving, the work doesn't stop. Um, and this uh, last bit is uh, the Met Office's March, April, May outlook, which is suggesting that it's not likely to be wetter than average. It's most likely to be near average to, or towards the dry side over the next three months. So I guess we'll have to see how we get on. Um, for our water resources, I guess we would like some more rainfall, but um, I guess we'll assess that next year. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, everyone. And if you've got any questions, I'm happy to help. Brilliant. Thanks, Stephen. Really appreciate that. And, and a big thank you really for stepping in at short notice. I know we were expecting Lucy and we can see Lucy's name on the uh, on the last slide here, but um, uh, thank you for stepping in at short notice and giving that presentation. Really interesting. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, if you have any other questions, please pop them in the Q&A. Um, so a question from Malcolm about the pictures uh, and uh, graphs that you showed from previous years. Is there a correlation when we look at previous years where we've had, you know, significant uh, lack of rainfall and the drought events? Uh, is there any correlation to the weather patterns or the patterns generally that help to predict what might happen in the future? So Malcolm says, could we actually try and predict what might happen either this year, but or even into next year, 2024? Yeah. So um, I guess we've had quite a few dry years in the last sort of since sort of 2018 you could say but we've had droughts in 2010 um, and 2018 last year 2019 was quite dry in places as well so there does seem to be a bit of a pattern developing um, and I think what we're seeing um, is particularly a, a dry spring which then sort of 
leads us on into the summer at a lower than sort of where we'd like to be um, point, which then does cause some problems in uh, in the summer and going into the autumn. And I, I'm sure many of you remember last year that we did see some sort of like hose pipe bans implemented. Um, but we do use the, so the um, climate projections that Chloe was mentioning were the RCP emission scenarios. Um, we have been using those to project or forecast river flows up into the year 2080. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously quite a long way out and they are just forecasts and projections and we're not putting much certainty to them. But unfortunately, they do show that we are likely to see um, with the we're likely to see wetter winters, but drier summers. So we are likely to see uh, more droughts in the future, they could become more severe, longer. Um, but I guess with the with these projections, because they are showing wetter winters, we might have a little bit of resilience going into the summer. But it is <laughs> quite hard to say, um, especially these were just forecasts of river flows going out to that sort of end of century type um, timeline. Right, yeah, and I think following on from that, Edmund asks about the kind of that resilience again, uh, particularly if we go into multi-year drought. So as you say, with the kind of projections going forward, wetter winters, drier summers, then, you know, that potentially precludes multi-year droughts, but clearly they, they will happen. Um, is there anything, have we, you know, looking at multi-year droughts in the past, 75, 76, have we got examples of that and and how kind of, you know, we could, what we can learn from those, I guess, from a resilience perspective? Yeah, so um, yeah, 75, 76, as you mentioned, was a multi-year drought. Um, we saw one quite recently as well in 2010 and 2011. Um, and that's what um, we call it sort of having having one dry winter is fine. <laughs> having two is getting a bit more worrisome. But if we're talking about sort of three dry winters in a row, we could start to see some sort of more serious problems. Um, and in terms of resilience, I guess, in terms of water resources and reservoirs and things, it is down to our water companies to manage the reservoirs and the um, water levels. And there's been for a long time now lots of ideas about transferring water from different areas of the country. Um, I don't know how that's progressing because um, I don't uh, work for the water companies, but um, you you would have seen last year there were a lot of water saving messages put out by the um by the water companies we had temporary use bans i in a lot of places um in the country so i guess that kind of stuff helps us to use less water um to sort of keep those supplies uh prolonged so so they don't run out yeah, great. No, thank you. And I think that partially answers Michael's question as well. There are a couple of other questions in, in the Q&A. If you're happy to just respond to those in slower time during the rest of the afternoon, that would be great, Stephen. I think just one one point, it was something that happened certainly at the end of the summer. There was a there was a great video that came from Rob Thompson at the University of Reading showing there were three cups of water yeah. on very dry, parched ground, one on kind of fairly neutral ground and one on kind of watered ground and yeah. showing the difference of what happens when rainfall falls on these different grounds, you know, whether it's dry or, or moist, and the fact that, you know, it's almost the wrong type of rain, isn't it? Or the wrong type of ground to kind of capture that rainfall. So after a prolonged period of uh, of drought or lack of rainfall, when we do get this heavy rain, it just runs off the ground. It doesn't soak in and uh, obviously doesn't help to resolve the problem. So it was a really good video just to help show that. I think just yeah. it went, I remember it going viral at the time. So yeah, I remember that. It was really good to show how how well the water absorbed. And it's true, with these heat waves that we had this year, the, the ground did get baked. And almost in a way, when it is baked like that, it becomes almost water repellent. Yeah. Um, and to see our uh, soils get wetter and our reservoirs get higher, we really want a, a prolonged rainfall over a, few, a long time. We don't want those sort of torrential downpours which just cause flash flooding because that's not really doing anything for our soils um so yeah if we could have some more prolonged rainfall <laughs> steady rain for days on end which nobody wants but it nobody would help, wants it? but it would help yeah if it could do it in the night that would be great <laughs> yeah, 
So brilliant. Thanks, Stephen. As I said, there are some questions coming in, even in the chat as well. So if you're happy to have a look at those and provide a response, that would be fantastic. Sure, I'll have a look. Yep. 